today uh, we will be discussing about uh, the work learning theory of uh, Jean Piaget before that I hope that all of you are doing good staying safe in this time of pandemic Uh, we will be starting just with, I hope others also will join uh, in the course of time, maybe. Uh, anyway, this is going to be recorded, so those who wanted to see it also can visit the website, sorry, the Facebook page and they can see it later. Uh, uh, when Dr. Somo Singh talked to me about this particular uh, Facebook Live, I was in fact a bit busy in the early, early time and then I could uh, come for this only at now. Uh, so the uh, uh, area that I am going to discuss is about the learning theory of Piaget. And this uh, area I have uh, suggested mainly because I understand that most of the participants and viewers of this particular program of this Facebook Live uh, are uh, postgraduate students, PhD students, and even some of you are uh, novice uh, teacher educators. So uh, I thought I will discuss this particular topic. Uh, I'm sure that many of you might have come across uh, the works of Piaget, Jean Piaget as a great psychologist who uh, lived in Switzerland. He was born in Switzerland actually because his father was a Swiss citizen. And of course he has a good connection with France as well because his mother was French. Uh, so, uh, so in that way he has uh, the culture of both uh, Swiss and French. Uh, Piaget, in fact, was a kind of a person who lived the whole life uh, like a uh, like a sannyasin, you would say, who was thinking and working about about how intellectual development happens, how learning happens, how knowledge is being generated. So the study of generation of knowledge, all these are the areas that he worked upon basically uh, you know he was in fact a child prodigy and he has uh, you know even at the early stages maybe ar nearly around some 15 years of age or maybe 10 to 15 years of age itself he started you know manifesting uh, the spark of intellectualism in him. Uh, his early studies came up uh, about uh, albino sparrow, a kind of a sparrow, you know. Uh, he observed them meticulously and he started uh, listing out the major characteristics of this uh, albino sparrow and uh, he wrote a paper about albino sparrow and it was published when he was nearly around some 10-12 years age. So this could be his first uh, publication, I believe. So in that way, his early interests were in, uh, were in biology, basically. Uh, and then later, his studies about um, uh, snails was quite famous. He has, he has conducted a, a lot of study about, about the life of snails. And then he brought out a lot of new information about that particular area as well. Uh, uh, basically, I would say that, you know, Piaget, uh, we should thank uh, Jerome S. Bruner uh, for uh, bringing in Piaget to the academic field because Piaget was conducting a lot of studies about 
human intellectual development and he worked a lot deep into the genetic epistemology genetic epistemology in the sense that he studies the the epistemology of generating knowledge genetic epistemology uh, the generation of knowledge construction of knowledge he he worked deep into this particular areas and he was uh, he was very much immersed in this areas but uh, we should note that american uh, academic uh, system uh, is one of the strongest system uh, not only now even at that time uh, which could not accept the observations of piaget at that point of time and it is jerome s bruner who was a professor at uh, harvard university's cognitive uh, uh, study center uh, it was in fact jerome s bruner who uh, who developed a kind of uh, an interest in piaget study and uh, it was bruner who used piaget's works in the academic circle of uh, america and thereby bringing in attention to the work of piaget so in that way i would uh, think that we must thank we must profusely thank to the uh, bruner for bringing in such a wonderful academic to the forefront you know even if that that kind of a great support was not given to piaget from this american background you know the the hegemony of academia which is going on very still very prevalent even now is is very much hierarchical in its structure so if you are not offering something in accordance with the academic culture which is prevailing in us or in the dominant countries your academic contributions will not be accepted so in that way piaget has got a good friend in bruner and then who has invited him to us and then in bruner used to remind about it in his uh, biography his first meeting with piaget was at boston and then uh, piaget was there for a, a lecture and then and then bruner was invited for a, a dinner and their first meeting was so beautiful that's what he mentions in his biography bruner mentions in his biography and uh, i told you piaget has a culture has a has a connection with the uh, french uh culture as well and uh, this is quite interesting many of us not have noticed this particular uh, uh uh point in the in the life of uh, piaget one of you might be sure about uh the 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 person behind uh the first intelligence test that means intelligence quotient uh intelligence question so i hope you know who it is uh binet and simon they were french citizens and they're french psychologists binet uh, binet in fact has become a great source of motivation for piaget because piaget came to france and then piaget worked with binet uh, and simon for the development of this first intelligence test intelligence quotient test so this has become a very important cusp in the life of piaget that he developed an interest in the area of intelligence and his uh, interest in how intelligence is developed in the child and in the in the in the adult this has become an area of interest since his association with simon and binet so you should remember that the simon binet test has a very you know great support of piaget as well but we are not mentioning it even though piaget has a great role in designing the first test of intelligence that we have ever seen in our in our uh, in our academic society so piaget's basic interest i told you when he was working with uh, when he was working with the binet and simon was that he noticed that uh, when uh, some kind of thing 
it can be a word or it can be an action when it is asked when a child is asked to perform it usually child will consistently err in it so they may not be able to do it say for example a very complicated word say you know in malayalam we used to say that pavilam is a very difficult word for the small children to pronounce actually because the because the letter aya aya i think ya is not in hindi aya is not in tamil aya is not in uh, even kannada also i believe so it's quite a typical malayalam uh, letter so children will consistently fail in uh, uh, you know pronouncing this particular word any kind of word which has this ya uh, the, this letter of ya so uh, children will consistently make errors in it and maybe take the case of a small child and ask a child to do a job which only a elder person can do a child will consistently err in it maybe not only one child almost all the child across the world will err in doing that particular or will make mistakes in doing that particular task and when this task is given to a elder person or an adult person this adult person may not create a kind of a difference they, they may not create any kind of uh, you know failure they may be able to do it even in the first attempt itself so piaget noticed this particular difference and he believed that or it you know we should understand that how simple is a hypothesis going on it's not in a very complicated way how simple a, a hypothesis of a world renowned psychologist is being developed his idea was that the intelligence the way of thinking or the level of intelligence of the child and the adult is different this is this is the hypothesis that piaget has uh, constructed the edifice of his great intellectual work on cognitive development you look how simple the in the, in the hypothesis is and you know when in a society like ours when we create uh, uh, a hypothesis and then we try to make often as a very complicated you know statement of uh, uh, sen- you know statement or sentence uh, look at a great world renowned psychologist whose uh, basic assumption when he started with his intellectual uh, uh, work was you know there exists a difference between the level of intelligence of uh, the way of thinking of children and the adult so it is from here he started and he developed his interest in this of course i told you his uh, uh, his family background a bit and his uh, grandfather was a philosopher and then he wanted piaget also to be a uh, to be a, a specialist or, or an academic in, in in philosophy so because of this interest piaget had little uh, extensive reading in philosophy this has uh, uh, created a kind of an interest in him about epistemology so when his connection with simon and benet and this family support and interest of working in philosophy was you know uh, was a kind of a melange in piaget and then we have seen that philosophy of epistem or the epistemology or the or the science of knowledge or the theory of knowledge when it is combined with intelligence we were seeing the 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 heralding of a new area which was called as genetic epistemology so genetic epistemology is the area uh, that piaget has worked throughout his life i told you i could say that even like a sanyasin he worked it was a very you know uh, dedicated uh, 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 scientist uh, 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 in this particular area and you know very uh, interestingly you know piaget's idea of knowledge how this knowledge is been evolved he believed that our present knowledge has evolved over time actually so whatever we have 
in our knowledge bank is not a knowledge which is developed in our contemporary society or in our contemporary life instead it is evolved over a period of time and uh, we cannot invent all the knowledge that we use today because it has been evolved over a long period of time when you look at from the period of the origin of the single cell to the even the very latest modern society we can say that we have accumulated large amount of knowledge and all this knowledge is like addition to the old knowledge so we are adding up adding up adding up and adding up you just imagine uh, the development of a zygote actually you know a zygote is 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 been developed from a single cell at the time of conception and this single cell what happens will split into the neck this first cell will split into and the second cell will be formed and this first cell and second cell will again split in again next cells are formed from all these cells are split into a zygote is formed and all these cells are again been 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 split and then a human being is been taken and you know what happen when human being are born automatically some old cells will get destroyed so some knowledge will be so every frequent interval some cells will be added some cells will be destroyed this is a continuous process this is quite similar to uh, the way we have developed knowledge over a period of time knowledge from a single cell to to multiple and over a period of time you know many quantum of knowledge that we have accumulated over a period of time must have lost lost also and we should accept it that's what we used to say that the quantum of knowledge that the traditional indian society had is not at all there now you can imagine a period of time where knowledge was developed and there was no facility for preserving the knowledge and there is no book there is no pen there is no material to write we have crossed all those time how much of knowledge we might have lost and how much of knowledge we have added all these are quite interesting to think about so i just wanted to tell you another uh, you know analogy of this knowledge addition the idea of knowledge addition by uh, piyash just imagine a single wagon single bogey train a single bogey train will be added with next bogey yet another bogey and then it will continue and finally it will become a long bogey of trains so it will take the form of a train then and gradually what happens you just imagine this is not happening really from a single bogey automatically another bogey also is taking place similarly knowledge is spreading or multiplying from the existing knowledge to to multiples a manifold of knowledge is been developed as a result of this so this was piyash's basic idea and this is applicable for human being also and we develop knowledge and this knowledge in our cognitive structure is like a train or is like a zygote say single cell we have one basic knowledge that basic knowledge will split into new cells will come up new knowledge will come up how this new knowledge comes up two cells cannot stand independently instead two cells once a cell is the product of another cell so this production process of one cell from another cell is quite quite very important for the theory of piyashian one cell is originated from another cell that means one knowledge is originated from another knowledge and this another knowledge is the existing knowledge so every new knowledge is originating from from the from the existing knowledge so that's what piyash's basic idea about evolution of knowledge basically and before going into his core idea i would say that i think we should uh, uh, i think we should uh, uh, we should look at the basic uh, major concepts of uh, uh, piyash i would i would like to bring into your attention about 
mainly four basic concepts of Piaget before discussing his idea of learning. The first basic concept is cognitive structure. Second one is schema. Third one is uh, uh, assimilation. And then fourth one is accommodation. And then there are some other more concepts like organization, adaptation, equilibration and disequilibration. This we will discuss in course of time. But basically I just wanted to confine it with major four ideas, major four concepts. They are cognitive structure, schema, assimilation and accommodation. Now cognitive structures are the basic mental process people use to make sense of information. So it's, it's a very basic mental process people use to make sense of information. That means that if there is no cognitive structure, you will not uh, derive a meaning out of uh, an information. So then what is an information? So anything that we come across is the source of an information. Is source of an information. Say for example, a piece of stone. A piece of stone. A piece of stone is a piece of stone, but it is not only a stone. That stone is a store of information as well. It consists of. It consists of enormous amount of information that geologists have shown us. So every piece of stone is is a is a ocean of knowledge as well. So this information, say for example, if this stone wanted to make sense to an individual, this individual needs a cognitive structure. That's what the basic idea is. So without this basic structure, of cognitive structure, this basic component of cognitive structure, we may not be able to develop sense of information, sense of meaning of the different, uh, you know, uh, uh, experiences, commodities, objects, things of that sort which comes, which encounter us. And I would like to uh, uh, suggest, a, you know, cognitive structure with a kind of an analogy. I just wanted to share with you an analogy of a cognitive structure. Now, uh, everyone will have this cognitive structure. That's what uh, an important condition of this cognitive structure. This cognitive structure is with everyone, with every human being. I do not know whether I would say that every animal as well. But let us limit our discussion with human because when we talk about animal we are we are sometimes maybe confusing or maybe complicating the issue so i just wanted to confine it with human being so every human being has a cognitive structure whether it is for einstein and it is for me it's for you or even for a person whom we used to say that he is not mentally performing well. He is not, uh, you know, performing good in a normal society. Uh, means a person of low measured intelligence. So, he also will have a person got zero uh, or maybe lost to mark in a intelligence scale. They also will have a cognitive structure. So, point is, like you have a heart, like you have an Atma that we believe in Indian mythology, you have a cognitive structure. Everyone has a cognitive structure. And this cognitive structure, <coughs> and this cognitive structure can be developed. That means this growth of developed cognitive structure. This cognitive structure is elastic in a way that it can be elaborated to at any point of level. At any point of level. You know, we used to say that in the Princeton University, uh, the brain of Einstein was preserved for a long time. You know, there is a story that when autopsy of uh, Einstein was done, 
the doctor who did autopsy has stolen the brain of uh, Albert Einstein to make studies. So this was kept for a long time and then he passed away, I believe, some nearly some five, six years before this doctor has passed away. And then he used to send out results of his observation about the brain of uh, uh, Albert Einstein and then he has reported that Einstein has used only 6% of his total brain capacity. Only 6% of his brain capacity. So if Einstein has only used only 6%, then what would be our percentage of use of our brain? We should think about it. And then, uh, you know, this is like this. You don't worry about learning so much of facts, uh, storing so much of information, and, uh, you know, you don't worry about it. It's never going to be filled. It is enormous space. Enormous space. It's something like a bag, you know, when we go for a long journey, we have a bag, we put up our dress, arrange our dress in it, then we feel that we have little more dress, you know, then we open first layer, and then we open the second layer, so the bag will grow up. Similarly, this is an endless bag with loads of zip, which can be opened, so that, don't worry about it, that's never going to be saturated. In the lifetime of a human being, so that's what cognitive structure is so elastic, and it can be it can be uh, elaborated at any point of level. It can contain so much of information, and um, uh, I just wanted to connect, or maybe to give an analogy of uh, of a cognitive structure, which is uh, with everyone. So this cognitive structure, say for example, uh, you know, a ma I have a very, you know, very good margin-free market, or, or or I would say supermarket, or maybe something of that sort, margin-free market or a supermarket. And this margin-free market or supermarket, I used to visit every, uh, maybe once, um, once in a week or something of that sort. We used to go for purchasing, you know, groceries and other commodities. And it's quite well arranged uh, uh, market, quite well arranged. And it has a lot of shelves also. When you go to a margin free market or a supermarket, it has a lot of shelves in which commodities are arranged, groceries are arranged all in separate, separate sections. You can see that. And I would like to compare the cognitive structure to a the supermarket, a, the supermarket or a margin free market. This margin free market or supermarket where I used to visit, I told you, is a very systematic arrangement of commodities. I just love going there. You know, it's not at all, you know, clumsy. It's very well arranged and then you will feel like roaming around and then collecting a lot of items and then you may sometimes uh, put in your bag more than what you need sometimes. That's what that... Uh, that shop is like you know varieties of information sorry varieties of commodities and then all these commodities are arranged in a very very systematic way that's what a good cognitive structure as well because you know when information comes in this information will be sorted and arranged in a particular mm -hmm. place say for example if you want uh, coconut oil in this particular margin free market, all the coconut, all kinds of oils are kept in a particular shelf. So you can go to that particular area and you can collect it and then come back. Soaps, all the soap, detergent soaps and then wash soap, bath soap, everything is in a single row. Groceries are in another row. So if a person wanted to, to take any kind of commodity from this, he can immediately locate and immediately he can take it. That is the quality of a good cognitive structure. It will arrange the information like a neat and systematic supermarket so that there will not be any difficulty for you to collect or recollect. I would say when we are talking about cognitive structure, we should use the word recollect that information quite easily. On the other hand, I know where my university is working at Kerala, it's in Kasaragod, and this is a small village, and then 
and then there is a margin free supermarket very nearby and uh, it's not very well arranged i would say and sometimes it's so clumsy as well and then when i go for uh, shopping and some most often i used to ask him uh, hello where is this uh, uh, bat soap because once the bat soap will be on one side the next time it will be on the other side and you know shelves are kept in close by so that you have to walk with a little adjustment you have to so all this kind of uh, and things are not in well arranged sometimes things will be you know put in a in a you know in a clumsy way so that it's difficult to select and uh, and this is how so a very poorly arranged cognitive structure is like this when somebody asks something it will be quite difficult for you to collect it from this market from this shop from your cognitive structure of cognitive structure so this is how a good cognitive structure is so my, my no, i told you the the assumptions about a cognitive structure that it is with everyone it has enormous capacity to grow and i told you that the quality of a good cognitive structure is that it will house the information in a very systematic way so that it can be accessed immediately without any without any kind of delay so that is the quality of a cognitive structure so this is the first concept which i wanted to discuss with you basic idea of piaget and the second idea is schema the second major concept is schema i am sure that most of you might have learned about this this particular notion maybe at your b ed level or m ed level and you may be sometimes a master than me but still i was just uh, discussing this with you schema was you know piaget first used this idea in 1923 actually so in in one of his research paper he used this particular word schema and then for him schema in that particular paper he has defined the schema as a basic unit of knowledge that related to all aspects of the world basic units of knowledge that related to all aspects of world basic unit of knowledge the most elementary and the most basic unit of knowledge is the schema that means that you have the very elementary level of a particular information so this will be more clear Uh, when we say that schema is a kind of a mental representation or an image of an information an object an incident a role or an individual and something almost everything so very simplistically when we say moving away from the formal definition of uh, piaget we would say that schema is nothing but a mental representation or a mental image of the knowledge knowledge can be from anything i told you anything is subject of knowledge a stone a water a man or a anything anything is a, a source of knowledge so it's a mental image or a mental representation of basic source of knowledge now it will be more clear for you when i talk to you about different varieties of schema Piaget talked about there are different types of schema he mentioned that there are object schemas what is object schema i if you ask me about pen i will have an image of pen in my mind so that is an object schema pen is an object so that object is there with within my schema so that object is there in me now if you ask me about uh, about book i have schema in my mind so it's a mental image of a book in my cognitive structure it is there in my cognitive structure i i do not know whether cognitive structure is here don't misunderstand me i was just unknowingly pointing my finger to there maybe cognitive structure where is it locating that we have to ponder over i believe okay anyway cognitive structure itself is a very abstract idea we do not know where it is located and you know object schemas are various almost all the objects in this world we will store in our cognitive structure in the form of a schema now 
if I ask you, do you know that you have a different kind of a schema? Do you know uh, uh, iceberg? Have you seen iceberg? You know, iceberg also is a schema for those people who have seen it. Or for us, we have seen it in TV or something of that sort. So, almost everything is a schema. Almost every object is a mental representation that we had about it in our cognitive structure. So, object schemas are there, person schemas are there. Now, I believe that I am a schema for all of you. Or maybe you all will have a schema of your teacher, schema of your father, schema of your mother, and different, different schemas are there. We all have schemas about our own relatives, or about our own friends, and then various, various people. So, people are represented as a schema in our cognitive structure. Then social schemas are there, how we should behave in, in particular places. And event schemas are there. Say, for example, Facebook Live is an event schema for you. Or Google Meet is an event schema for you. Or the inauguration of a seminar. Or the seminar itself is an event schema for you. So you will have an idea how a seminar will be. You will have an idea how a Google Meet will be. So there will there, so there are um, event schemas, self schemas, role schemas, different different types of schemas are there. Almost everything that you that you see is a schema in your mind, in your cognitive structure. So this uh, cognitive structure is filled with the schema. Now I am going to compare this schema with groceries and different kinds of commodities which are available in a cognitive so in a cognitive. In a, in a supermarket. So, if supermarket has different kinds of commodities and articles in it, our cognitive structure has different schemas in its uh, in the cognitive structure. So, that is uh, what is called, that's what basically uh, uh, the idea of cognitive structure and schema. So, if schema uh, is being equated with commodities in a supermarket and cognitive structure is being equated with or paralleled with uh, supermarket. So that's what I wanted to tell you about it. Now, now here is the point. How do we learn new things? That's what Piaget asked basically. One of the very important questions that Piaget asked. How do we learn new things? Which I have given a, a very, very distant hint about it, but we are coming deep into that. Piaget here introduced uh, a particular kind of a, a structural sequencing. He believed that, this is very interesting, he believed that we all would like to be in a state of equilibrium. In a state of equilibrium. What is that equilibrium? There is no pressure, there is no tension, uh, the SAR has not asked you to submit the uh, project. Your college principal has not asked you to submit the report. No pressure at all. We wanted to be in an equilibrium. All the three times we have enough food and your father is not asking you to go to the shop and get something and your mother is not asking you to go to uh, the kitchen and do this job, that job. Nothing. Every, no, no botheration for me. No botheration. I'm absolutely in a state of equilibrium. No fear for me, absolutely secure. I'm in a state of equilibrium. But the question is, would you, would you like to be in that state for a long time? I don't. Because, because being in a same kind of a very static position, even if it is secured and equilibrated, we all like to have changes, isn't it? We all like to have changes. Human being likes to have changes. That's how when Asian pains came up with any kind of a pain which you need not remove it. That will be there for 100 years or maybe more than that. You know, uh, people uh, rejected it because we want to see different colors in our house, paint our house. So we like change. So even if we are given with all facilities and we are in an absolute state of equilibrium, we will break that equilibrium and we will get into disequilibrium. That's human nature, basically. We all like to have changes. So when there is an absolute equilibrium, you know what we will do? We will break that equilibrium 
and then we will get ourselves push ourselves into disequilibration that is what you know when we are in a state of equilibrium you know how this happens this disequilibrium when a new thing when a new thing happens when in a, in a new in when new object come forward to us or when a new person come forward to us or when a new incident come forward we encounter with all this will break our our attention or equilibration say for example new things comes up we are absolutely uh, disturbed what is this how shall i do this say for example when your mobile phone is changed say just imagine that your mobile phone is changed and you absolutely new mobile phone has come where its configuration is different you have to study a lot something of that sort and your old photos are not there your you have to old phone numbers are there disturbs you sometimes it gives a kind of a disequilibration for you so anything which is new will bring in disequilibration so this new has to be accommodated so that our cognitive structure will come to a state of equilibration so i wanted to tell you this precisely learning is a process whereby an individual move from disequilibrium to equilibrium that's what piaget defines learning so for learning to happen there must be a disequilibrium according to piaget so we all in this particular ict oriented era do believe that learning is fun learning is entertainment and then even we have coined a word and edutainment means education plus entertainment and then understanding f u n understanding fun plus understanding these all are the terminologies that we have brought into our into our academic discussions but you know there is a psychologist who stand out and says that no learning is no more fun learning is disturbance disturbance learning is absolutely disturbance nothing more than that and maybe at the end when you equilibrate yourself you will have a little pleasure but the whole process of learning is is not possible if you are if you are if you are disturbed because if you are not disturbed you stop there so you wanted to see how you can make your own self equilibrated that's how we learn so we actually believe that disequilibration to equilibration is the process of learning and in between this disequilibration to equilibration there are two steps more that's what piaget says the first one is assimilation and the second one is accommodation i'll tell you about it assimilation and accommodation assimilation is the process of applying the schemas we already possess to understand something new so that means that if you have something with you use that thing to acquaint with the new thing so if you use your existing schemas to acquaint with new schemas that process is called as assimilation use your existing one to acquaint with the new one that's what is uh, assimilation basically is so if our cognitive structure i told you there are numerous schemas already available with you and when there is a new schema comes up you know use your existing schema to the new schema say for example when a small boy who knows about a uh, 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 dog he knows about dog and then this dog uh, uh, it may be a, his domestic uh, one and then when he go to a zoo or a or a museum he happen to see a, a tiger say for example tiger or maybe a lion he has never seen nor even through uh, through picture or video he has never just imagine that that's that's a case so then you know what he will think he knows a uh, dog so if somebody asking or he may himself believe that this is some some sort of a dog and then uh, his parents or maybe his mother or maybe father will tell him that this is is lion or maybe this is a uh, tiger then you know this dog in the mind of the child will gradually 
split in from this dog to a new kind of an information like a cell is been split from the existing cell so in that way this idea of a new animal needs a substantiation or a base of a existing animal in the mind of a child and this simple process is essential throughout the process of learning that's what piaget says and this process of connecting the existing animal with the new animal is called as assimilation and second one is second idea is accommodation accommodation is a accommodation means the process of changing an existing schema or creating a new one because new information doesn't fit the schemas one already has so the new schema or the new information which is confronting you is not at all with you so you have to accommodate bring in that new schema in your existing cognitive structure so this process of developing the new idea in your mind is is called as uh, called as accommodation according to according to bruno in this process of uh, uh, assimilation and accommodation you know what piaget says in the process of assimilation there will be a shuttling of schemas which is happening between the cognitive structure and the new schema that is confronted by the individual you know when you come across a new information that's what i told you about the case of a small boy who knows about a dog but who doesn't know about a tiger he knows dog but he doesn't know tiger what happens he will shuttle his existing schema existing schema of dog to this new schema of of course this new schema is not within his cognitive structure he will shuttle his existing schema to get it connected with the new schema so the dog schema will be shuttled to the tiger schema so when this connection is established tiger also has four leg it also something like a furry animal it's it's you know what happen you know you connect it establish a relationship between this existing and new this process of shuttling is very essential for establishing a connection so assimilation essentially consists of this process of shuttling of existing schema with the new schema this is essential and only when this connection is happened accommodation of the new schema will happen uh, i will uh, i'll tell you a, a very brief example and uh, to to help you to understand how this this shuttling process will happen i keep on using this example for my emmet classes so um you just imagine that you are just uh, Uh, meeting a strange person let me come to my own example you know i was working with pondicherry university for a long period of time i could see many of my old students also saying hi here prashant nahik and then amlesh are there you just imagine that you know i am i just going back i'm just going back to my pondicherry days and just i was once upon a day i was just walking through a very famous market in pondicherry which was called as jain uh, jain market jain road in the sunday market i was just walking without any kind of purpose you can call it as a wandering i was just walking in a sunday and then somebody came to me and then who just greeted me hello amrit sir how are you and then uh, i was quite wondering i do not know this person you know <coughs> my cognitive structure i doesn't have this particular person as a schema that's the problem so i am quite wondered so what happens my cognitive structures equilibrium got a bit disturbed because i do not know him but he is calling me with my name hello amrit sir how are you how are you doing i said okay i'm fine then he started uh, asking about my Uh, you know asking further question hello sir how is your daughter doing how is your son doing how is your family are they here or are they at kerala at kerala and then he even started asking the name of my son oh i was absolutely wondering you know i do not know this person 
but this person is asking almost hello sir how is chinmay doing and then i you know chinmay is the name of my son he knows my my son's name or how is medha doing i am absolutely you know wondering i have no i have to answer to him because he knows almost all where about of mine and then i am absolutely a blank slate about uh, him who is he this is a disequilibration for me this happens to you when a new information comes to you it can be a it can be an abstract information it can be a person it can be an object it can be a commodity it can be a new role when you wanted to take responsibility of it can be anything of that sort anything that can be a schema you know what i will do to resolve my equilibration that's my my genetic you know you know uh, i would say that you know mm, a reflex action or maybe reflex or i am genetically you know you know condition to resolve my my disequilibration so then i wanted to resolve this problem you know he knows everything about me and i do not know anything about him i have never seen him at all so then i asked him back how do you know me say uh, have you uh, uh, been a student of mine for my b when i was teaching in beard or something of that sort uh, uh, how do you know me i asked him do you uh, are you a student of me mine when i was uh, teaching for a ba program or something of that sort so i asked him uh, because i was teaching in a particular college uh, its name was nss training college i asked him are you a student of nss training college then he said no so when i asked this question of are you a student of nss training college i am shuttling my first schema to this new schema because nss training college where i was teaching for us for some time is a schema existing in my cognitive structure so i shuttled this nss training college to this particular person and then he said no sir i am not a student of nss training college so that shuttling was failed so my disequilibration continued so then i ask him are you a student of pondicherry university some other department so you come across me he said no 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 i am not a student of uh, pondicherry university i am uh, uh, not a student of pondicherry i am not i am i am doing a job here oh again pondicherry university was a schema in me and that schema also has got spoiled i tried to shuttle it that also failed and then i asked him um uh, had i been uh, in some program where you attended in a seminar something of that sort he said no sir absolutely nothing of that sort you know uh, i i am a friend of your this person ex person he told me i am a friend of your ex person along with him i came to your home one day i came to your home one day you just imagine that uh, name is uh, name is nishant for example one of my phd student so nishant so along with nishant i came to your home one day do you remember on that day you offered a cup of coffee to me some biscuits to me or piece of cake to me do you remember that oh okay i remember it okay because nishant is an existing schema in my mind nishant is already existing in my mind that's a schema with me so then he i sh- he helped me to shuttle the nishant schema to him connection is established when this connection is established that state is called as assimilation oh you are a friend of nishant okay all right you yeah. this state is called as assimilation and the next step of accommodation starts from there then i will ask you um uh, will you please share me your will, will you please let me know your name and then he will say my name is um, this one okay this is my name okay then i said okay so where are you from basically then he says i am from this particular state or maybe this particular district and then i ask him what are you doing here and he says oh i am doing in a particular kind of a business maybe medical business something of that so i am doing a business here anyway okay fine that's good and then 
and then now I have learned his name and I know from where he is and I know what he is doing and know what he is doing. Am I audible now? Somebody is uh, saying some sound problem. Is it all right now? Am I audible? Is it audible now? Okay, so uh, uh, So I know almost now everything about him. You know what I will do? Now I will take this new person as a schema and I will keep this new schema close to this schema which is existing in my Kubernetes structure. So I will place it there. And this placement of the new schema to the existing schema is called as accommodation. So when I do this process of accommodation, my learning happens because this particular new schema itself will in gradual course of time will be capable of attaching new schema to it. So this is how learning happens according to Piaget. That means that without having connecting the existing knowledge, existing knowledge to the new knowledge means existing knowledge is a bit of schema new knowledge is another schema without connecting this existing knowledge to the new knowledge and placing this new knowledge adjacent or maybe close to the existing knowledge like a supermarket where you keep it in a, say for example if it is a grocery it should keep it along with the grocery if it is a foodstuff we should keep it along with foodstuff so attaching this new schema to the existing schema's corner, existing cognitive structures, uh, schemas, similar schema's corner, you make learning possible. And Piaget believed that when you make this process of attachment, connecting the existing one with the new one, and that process of connection will result in a kind of a new schema. And this new schema, of course, will be capable of connecting and accommodating future schemas. So that's how learning happens according to Piaget. That's how Piaget insisted or throughout the life he argued that without connecting the existing, no, existing knowledge with the new knowledge, learning will be absolutely impossible. So simple. And that's what Piaget talked about his theory of learning and I have not even touched his theory of development. Theory of development I haven't explained at all and his theory of moral development of course is, is such an ocean of knowledge which uh, is very difficult for us to cross him and he has developed his Geneva school because most of his studies were conducted on his own children. He was observing his own children and of course other children as well and then he started his Geneva school and then the center for genetic epistemology in Geneva all these are landmark contributions of Piaget and of course when you start reading Piaget I would say that Piaget is not so friendly for reading uh, his thoughts were so complicated and then so deep so that when you go for understanding Piaget through his original book you may find it a bit difficult to, to read and comprehend him because he is not a, a you know established uh, uh, writer to of course he's an established writer he's not a sort of a writer who catches the attention of the readers but when you read Bruner you know he will catch you along with you he will walk Bruner will walk so that's that's what Bruner and Piaget how do they differ in their style of writing basically. And then I hope sometime later I will share with you his theories of uh, development, uh, cognitive development and moral development and so on. And uh, I hope I will stop here. Um, I should thank you for, for uh, watching me. Um, if you have any doubt, do I need to spend some more time? Uh, maybe 5 to 10 minutes or so. Or if there is any doubt, I can just briefly respond, otherwise
maybe I'll wait for two or three minutes to see whether there is any doubt. Otherwise, I'll stop it. So thank you, uh, Dr. Somu. You're doing a great work. I appreciate it. Uh, all those enthusiastic listeners, not listeners, viewers, thank you so much. <laughs>